My name is Phil Lamy. I'm the Senior Security Analyst for the province. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, as part of the presentation today, our journey as we've kind of uh, re-looked at our government, our, at our program in general. And uh, I'm hoping that it's a, a common story. It's stuff that people can relate to in terms of uh, uh, situations that you've gone through as well. So first of all, uh, I'd also like to thank all these fine places over here uh, that have been through bad days recently because we started out our day talking about how security has become complex and how we sell the importance of, uh, you know, really, really firming up our security programs and creating these relationships. These things don't happen without resources, effort, and money. And so, you know, the question is, how do we sell it? Well, we sell it by pointing out the fact that St. John got hit, uh, Newfoundland got hit, um, you know, that Northwest Territories got hit, you know, and it's quite easy when you just want to say, do you really want to be the next group that's standing up talking about our security program and, and what holes we have and what holes we may not have? So, you know, you don't want your security program to be nebulous. You want to be able to speak to it intelligently and perhaps with uh, some sort of KPIs. But in order to have KPIs, you have to be measuring stuff, not just doing a bunch of good things here and there, but actually being able to point to something that is your program and saying, this is how we measure it. This is how we honestly take a good hard look at our program every year and we talk about how we're doing. So it's not just a finger in the air. Um, so we took a almost what I feel was a step back like a few years ago and Rick and I were kind of talking about this that um, within government, you know, we were aligning ourselves, we were moving forward and kind of maturing our operation and we were using the standards of good practice to do so. And then all of a sudden there was a shift. And I know somebody was talking this morning about, you know, their program developing being five years. Well, that's impossible in a government world because your leadership is going to change every four years. So you can't do that. You have to quickly implement your changes. So our program changed and the direction was, well, exactly what they were saying. It's for the business. So we want to redo our whole program so that it's easy to understand, easy to comply to, um, and that basically even the business could look at the policies and directives, interpret them, and implement uh, what needs to be implemented. Um, I really think, like, I feel like a mistake was made at that point because what they were forgetting about, it, there's a whole layer of people there that are the interpreters, the people who kind of take in the directives, to take in the policies and say, well, okay, we'll create a policy that makes sure we meet your strategic goals of the business, but, you know, we need to get a little bit complicated. When it comes to the language that we need to put in these directives, it can't be so simple, but fear not, we're going to provide you with people, interpreters, security analysts, security specialists that can actually help you in your path to ensuring, um, you know, that we've got those security controls in place that you need. So we took a good, hard, long look at the frameworks and we made a decision to go with NIST 800-53. Uh, revision 5 for our alignment purposes um, and there was a number of reasons for doing that. Most notably it's because it's fairly agile, it's very comprehensive framework and it actually is very quick to adapt and grow with the industry. So for example they already have like a risk management framework for cloud and AI. Like they've already developed out those strategies that basically bolt on to you know the other parts of their framework so it makes a whole lot of sense also our partners are all talking nest as well right so you know the advisories and alerts that we get from CISA, cccs uh you know the nsa they all kind of speak the nest language so we saw you know that the fact that some other frameworks aren't really going to be very helpful to us in that 
uh, aspect of trying to align. So the other thing you want to do as well is take into account um, the robustness. So we're going to come to it, I hope the slide's in there, but we're going to come to it where we talk about the robust robustness of NIST 800-53. And it's very robust. If you look at it in terms of its, its totality, it's 1,800 or sorry, 1,300 controls. Um, and that is massive. It's just way too much for any one organization. Nobody's going to be able to consume that much. So, but the layout of it in terms of having the control families, very easy for somebody to look at that diagram and understand what those control families are. and in general, what it is they're supposed to be doing. You know, if I say AC, access control. Well, you guys know that it's about access controls. Another one, AT, for awareness and training. You know, it's very easy to kind of build a set of directives around those control families. Question is, what do we actually implement? Because we're not gonna implement, you know, all of those controls. So we're going to get around to how we actually did that, but there's one other framework that I'd like to refer to very quickly because there's a direct tie between a very popular framework, mind you, called the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. But the NIST Cybersecurity Framework is not a robust framework. It, it's very commonly chosen or adopted, but the list of controls that exist within it are extremely limited. So nobody really should be building like a, a large organization uh, uh, security program around the controls listed only from the NIST cybersecurity framework. But there's that connection between NIST 800-53 and the cybersecurity framework, and that's what's important. Then we see the CIS top controls. CIS top controls is a list of, of 20 controls that they've actually break and broken down into implementation group one, implementation group two, and implementation group three. Implementation group one is what they refer to as your basic cyber hygiene. So this is where I've kind of backed up the bus as far as our cyber program goes and say, I don't want to do, be doing a bunch of things, some that are, you know, extremely good and others that are, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not providing as much value, uh, not being measured and not fully implemented, thought out. I want to make sure that first of all, we are establishing at least basic cybersecurity hygiene. At the very least, let's start there. And then we can build on top of that. So how do we do that? Well, there is a tie between the CIS top controls and the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, which of course then, as I mentioned, has a two degree separation to the 800-53 framework. So by pulling all these together and doing a cross reference, you can actually get yourself to a point where you say what it is for a control that we're trying to implement is defined by the NIST 800-53 framework, but what to implement as a starting point for basic cybersecurity hygiene is defined by going through that process of saying, we're just going to implement the controls that would be relevant to basic cybersecurity hygiene. So this is an example of the process that it kind of goes through where you start at the CIS control, you say, what, what code is it? Let's find it within that cybersecurity framework layer. And then we map it up with 800-53 to ultimately get a list of 800-53 controls. This is what ends up as a result of that activity. So I'm just gonna walk over here a little bit so I'm not guessing at the numbers. But when I look at it here, we can see that just by doing a little select count on there and only looking at uh, the full range of all the, um, 
all, all the controls that were imported from this, uh, the 800-53 framework was 1,189 of them. But if I then take it after doing all that filtering that I talked to and did a count again where IG is equal to IG1, so implementation group one, I end up with a count of 343. So that's how we've taken a framework that has close to 1,200 controls within it, said, I want to just look at the ones that are basic cybersecurity hygiene, and now I have, as the analyst, 346 to kind of look at <clears throat> and define. So then, if we look over on the right-hand side, you can actually see the other side benefit of this is that you can actually see the control families that these land in. So if you ever wanted to kind of say, where should we be focusing our bucks? And you were to say, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're focusing our bucks in areas where it is applicable to our business. Um, if we we're just talking about the cybersecurity hygiene, then we could see that we have accounts for each one of those families. So we heard in the past things like awareness and training. And I think Rick, again, you were, you were talking specifically about, you know, training, training, training. And I mean, this data tells us the proof is right there, right? There are more uh, entities from the basic cybersecurity hygiene that fall in that awareness and training family than any other family. And then if we look a little bit further down, we'll start to see that there's access controls and identity and uh, authorization, so the IA control families. So all that is very analytical. It's a very analytical approach to get to kind of our starting point. Then you need a tool, and, and Kevin would be happy to hear that uh, this is Entity Framework. This is a core development and entity framework in Microsoft that I just used to actually create a tracking tool for tracking all these NIST controls. <clears throat> and so I can come up here and I can actually say, filter out to me in that list everything that is not IG1. So I'm left with all the, uh, the NIST controls that are implementation group one, so only the ones that we care about at this time. And I can actually, uh, in looking at the, the, the right-hand side there, go into it where the control statement actually is, and I can list in that what is the people, process, or technology that is actually serving that. What, what is the people, process, or technology that we have in place that is actually filling this control requirement? So whether it be a policy, whether it be our tenable vulnerability, uh, whether it be our remedy uh, help desk software, whether it be our Palo Alto firewall, uh, whether it be a NOC team member or a SOC team member. It's like you can put that role, you can put, the, like I said, the whatever people process or technology that is in place there. The other part of it down on the bottom is that we can actually track what our maturity level in that area is. Is this something we're doing? Is it something that's ad hoc? Is it something that is actually documented at this point? Um, is it something that we continuously improve? So you can actually not just track what controls, but actually the maturity level of those controls. Um, the other thing you can track as well is the standard operating procedure or an SOP. So what that is the directive level, but for each directive, we also need standard operating procedures which are telling people how to implement these things specifically. So in here, we can track what standard operating procedure or what SOP is this particular NIST control part of. And then down, further down the bottom, we basically track who are the stakeholders. So when I first had this conversation uh, with our executive and, and tried to get the sponsorship for the time and effort to actually put into this, um, they said we, have, we only have one ask out of this, and that is that when we come out at the end of the day, 
we want to be able to say, here are all the things that an end user needs to know, right? Um, or here's all the things that a business owner needs to know. So creating handbooks for each of these areas. Uh, we talked about software development earlier today. What are the things that the software development teams need to know? Or what controls need to be listed as part of an, F, uh, an RFP for procurement? Basically, for each one of these uh, controls, we go in and we check off what group they are relevant to. So I can filter it out and say, here are all the controls that are relevant to procurement. So our program structure, we started out with the high level policy, which is our executive intent and how we plan to align it with the overall business strategy. And that is just one document. It's the only thing that we need to go through the legislature to actually uh, get in place or make any changes to. So it should barely ever change. Then we have our directives. So the high-level policy points to all the directives. The directives are aligned to NIST 800-53, so basically named by the same name as the control families. They are a set of NIST-defined controls, and we're starting with the CIS IG1, or Implementation Group 1, or just the basic cybersecurity. Um, so again, that's to ensure that we're going to, for each control that we're actually saying as an organization we need to have, we're going to make sure we at least have something there for each and every single control. What doesn't match up to any people, process, or technology is what we know is a gap. And it's what we know we need to go out and, you know, seriously consider getting a people, process, or technology for that, or having business tell us, okay, we recognize that, and we don't intend to actually have that control. So putting the control within the business um, to make that decision. Um, it's translated into organizationally re relevant statements. So we actually take that NIST language and we actually translate it into GNB language. And then we also include the accountability roles and responsibilities and we can actually make those roles and responsibilities documents uh, by, by basically pulling out those controls and what we know about those controls from the database that I've just shown you. And then we have our standards or SOPs and as I mentioned they're tied directly to the directives. So at any point, and this is probably one of the more valuable things, the lesson that I've learned over the years is you get in front of business and you tell them they need to do something, immediately their first reaction is going to be, show me where it says I need to be doing that. Well, you're going to be able to, to point directly from that standard right to the directive that it supports right up to that overarching policy. So there should be a clear line when there is that question. It should be clear enough in the standard that, you know, your interpreters can understand it. But again, if you set yourself up in such a way that your standards are so vague, you know, and you just say business has to understand this, right? It's not for business. Like, it's not intended that those things are consumable by business. It's you need the people there to help interpret it and help them make the right decisions. So under reporting, you know, at the end of the day, what do we do with all of this? At the end of the day, we can take each one of those categories and basically create key performance metrics that come out of it. For anybody who's played around in the Power BI world, you know, I can grab what I had there in my tool, the data that I had there in my tool, and say for access controls, here's the percentage of actual controls in that control family that we have actually implemented. This is the amount of them that are actually implemented and documented. This, these are the, the list of them, and this is how many of them are being constantly improved. You can actually start driving out that type of data for your executive 
so that you're, you're not giving it to them. You know, you might have a third party come in and do an audit for you every couple of years, but on a monthly basis, you could deliver to them how our program is currently functioning and performing. That's it.